Now, this idea of prakriti nature, we can look at this from two points of view. One is that we all share a nature. We, as human beings, part of the animal kingdom, we have certain things in common. And on the other side, we have a lot of particular qualities. Each and every one of us is different. We have our own samskaras. We have our own tendencies, our likes, our dislikes, our own personality traits. We're all different. But on some level, uh, as part of this human community, part of the animal kingdom, we, we share a lot of things in common. This is what uh, I, I have termed for myself Darwinian samskaras. <laughs> that we give a lot of credit to, to Darwin for recognizing that uh, all creatures, human beings, animals, that there are certain things that they have in common, certain basic needs, uh, certain desires, certain tendencies. We can look at these as basic survival, survival tools. This was a really Darwin's theory, that unless uh, a species has these uh, particular tools, we can say, they'll become extinct. So what are these different things? Desire for food, for shelter, for conveniences, or comforts. Every, every creature has to have these. A herding tendency to form a family unit, a village unit, and that means to procreate. If that's not in part of the DNA of any creature, then they'll cease to exist as a species. Then, to keep the species alive through, uh, oh sorry, then a competitive streak necessary for protecting ourselves. So this idea of looking upon others as strangers, we say this, of course, is based on some ignorance. We don't have a higher philosophical understanding, but creatures need that. They need to know that this is a natural enemy and we have to hide from them and protect ourselves. And then desire to avoid pain and to seek pleasure. So all of these things uh, are parts of the makeup of each and every human being to a different extent. So some people will be born uh, with a very light touch of all of these, and for some, these are very strong binding types of principles, especially these desires. Some people uh, really suffer from them, and they really uh, end up being slaves to their desires, slaves to their personality, and uh, other people seem to be able to uh, transcend a lot of these things, at least more easily than, than others. So. Uh, this is what we can call the human condition. And in Vedanta, we have some very beautiful ways of understanding this. It doesn't have to be this Darwinian idea. Uh, there's a, a verse that I find very helpful from Katupanishad that uh, really explains everything in a single verse, why we end up with all false identification and bondage and everything. It says that human beings were created in such a way that the senses go outward, and the mind goes outward through the senses, not turning back and, and realizing our own true nature. So from our very childhood, we identify with external things. That means with the body and the mind and the senses, and we create this false identification and bondage from a very early age. So we can see uh, there's a way of looking at this uh, kind of Darwinian, and then from this Vedantic point of view, how each and every one of us uh, necessarily ends up identifying with superficial aspects of our personality, including body, mind, senses, and uh, everything else, all of the samskaras that we're born with. It's a very natural thing, and uh, no one should feel bad about it, huh? that uh, we're all in the same boat. We can, we can explain it that way. So this is a, a thing kind of spiral out of control, this false identification. We keep uh, reinforcing it until we reach an age where uh, we discover that it's false and we discover that we're something more than that. And when that point comes, we're already in a big mess of trouble. We've already forged, forged a very strong sense of identification with our personality, huh? Yeah, she's laughing because, right? You know that it's true. Uh, I sometimes think that uh, we're all slaves to our personality. That it's very hard for us to, to transcend that, to get out of that. And this is something that uh, we forge from a very early 
uh, early age, as soon as we're old enough to form some type of sense of I, then everything is external. We, we don't form any concept of ourself as a conscious being, really, until we reach a certain age. I'll tell you an interesting story. Uh, I have a niece, and I remember she was probably, I don't know the age, maybe six or seven, eight, something like that, that age. And we had a family friend who, uh, they had a child who had some developmental problems that uh, uh, he's autistic or something, I don't remember exactly. So she was asking me, why does he behave that way? So I tried to explain to her that sometimes we have some sickness in the body or something. He has a kind of sickness in the mind. And then she looked at me and she said, what is the mind? She said, no concept. I was, I was surprised. But at that age, no concept of any interior mental sense of self or anything. Everything was externalized. So uh, at a certain age, uh, we start to develop that. They say... There was one French uh, psychologist, Piaget, child psychologist. He said that uh, one of the, the stages of development is when a child learns that it can tell a lie. And because that means that they recognize that uh, what they know inside is private for them. And that the other person will know what, what they tell them. So, uh, uh, but by the time we develop that, this is the problem, then uh, most of the damage has been done. And this sense of false identification becomes something very, very strong with us. So anyhow, uh, the, the few things, mm -hmm. hmm? anything? You can ask questions in between. I don't mind also. She's saying at that point, most of the damage is done. Most of the damage is done. That's very early. That's early. Yeah, some, some people claim that uh, uh, by the time we're in kindergarten, we've learned everything, well, life skills and everything has been forged. There's not too much, yeah. Early childhood development is very, very important. Wasn't there that book, Everything I Know, I Learned Everything? That's half a joke, but yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, learn to share, learn to take a nap. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember that book, yeah. Anyhow, a few of the side benefits of this is that... Uh, Sometimes we feel guilty, we feel, why do we have these thoughts, these desires, and everything? If we understand these are natural and common to everybody, that feeling of guilt will leave us. This guilt is a very terrible thing uh, in spiritual life and life in general. So we can be a little kind to ourselves and accept ourselves and say, yes, that we're part of the human kingdom. This is, this is the way we're wired somehow. Now, this doesn't mean that we accept it. It means that we recognize it. It doesn't mean that we say, well, what can I do? I, I mentioned before Swamiji's great statement. Yeah, just because something is natural doesn't mean we accept it. Spiritualized means fighting against nature. That means our own internal nature filled with desires and tendencies for all sorts of different things. So we recognize that everybody has desires. Everybody has some tendencies. Everyone has a little bit of uh, selfishness to a certain extent. That uh, when we read... Uh, Stita Prajna section in chapter 2 of Gita, there's one verse that I like very much that uh, talks about this God realized soul that uh, is not somebody who has no desires. It's someone who is not moved by desires. That desires flow into him like the rivers flow into the ocean. The ocean remains full and unaffected. It, the, well, the river at it, it, the source can be very strong and violent. When the river goes into the ocean, it's very calm and quiet. The ocean is hardly disturbed by it at all. So even, even the stita pragna, that uh, he'll be the one in, into whom these desires come without raising any waves. Uh, but he's not, we're, not only do we have desires, we like them. Kama kami. We desire to have desires. Yeah, this is, this is part of our nature. So we, we recognize that we're human beings. We're human beings, but we're trying to transcend that. We're trying to uh, realize our divine nature. See, this is the difference between the animal kingdom and the human kingdom. That uh, we're somewhere in between, in between the gods and the demons. That we have a little bit of animal nature and that divine nature. And we're trying to transcend the lower and realize the higher. This is why... 
Uh, even, the, even the devas, even the gods, are not qualified to strive for liberation. Only human beings. This is the theory that we have. That uh, if, if we pass away, go to some other loka, we get to uh, play the, the role of, of one of the devas for a, a whole cycle, we'll have to come back again and to complete our spiritual journey on this level. Because here, we have a little bit of, uh, little bit of free will. Now, this verse uh, emphasizes this psychological determinism. But we'll find that uh, it, it can't snuff out this little bit of free will that we all have and we all feel. Now, this idea of free will is a big subject, and Sri Ramakrishna, he'll take a very high point of view sometimes and say there's no free will, everything is mother's will. But from our point of view, unless we recognize that we have some free will, we won't do anything. Then it's defeatism. Then, then we, we simply throw up our hands and say, what can I do? Nigra kim karishiti. Yeah. What good will it do to even make any attempt? No, we have to, we have to read that and say that, uh, yeah, we understand it's a big challenge, but it'll have to, have to be some, something that we can do. The, there are other verses in Gita, which I also like very much. Arjuna, he'll ask a question of Sri Krishna, which to me is one of the most insightful questions we have in the entire Gita. That he says, why is it that we very often do things that we know we shouldn't do, and we do it without wanting to do it, and we do it as if we're being forced to do it, it's psychological determinism, as if we're being forced, our own nature is making us do it. Why is it? And then uh, Sri Krishna, he doesn't say that, uh, no choice, that uh, you're stuck with that, your nature will make you do it. He says, no. He says, it's because of this rajas, this karma, krota, and all of the passion, that we can add Thomas, Thomas and, and, and rajas. Because of that, uh, uh, you're unable to control them, so they control you. So we have this, this idea that at a certain point, all these lower tendencies control us. We go a little higher and higher and higher. We get to the point where we can control these lower tendencies to a certain extent. Then we understand that, yes, nigraha, we have to practice not simply pushing things down and, and uh, trying to... Um, stuff them inside as a subconscious, but really that uh, we can exert some type of self-will. Sometimes we have this idea of, you know, the cow that's tethered to the post. And uh, it, it has the ability to wander within that circle. That much self-will, it can't go beyond it. So there are limitations, but even within that area that uh, uh, we have a tremendous ability to change. We have to believe that, that we can change. When this question comes up of free will, do we have free will or not? I always think it's not a question of yes or no, it's a question of to what extent do we have free will? And we find, and Gita will also uh, give this indication, that uh, the more we're free from the effects of rajas and tamas, the more we're able to make decisions based on some type of uh, higher understanding of things, to use some sense of, of viveka, some sense of discernment, discrimination, and, and making decisions that won't be based entirely on what I want and what I need. Huh? Then we become mature human beings. Then we, we, we can say that we've started our spiritual life. There's other verse I like very much, that it says that who is, who is the yogi and who is the happy man? Who is a happy person? Someone who is able to withstand the force of these, of these, these passions, who is able to do this. Uh, that person is not just a person of self-control, but a happy person. Huh. Before the fall of the body. Huh. This kama krodha ulbhavam vegam. This, this, uh, this tremendous pull or push, we can say, that's born of these passions. That it is possible to withstand them. That means not act in accordance with them. So I'm contradicting the verse. Huh? That uh, uh, there is a certain extent to which we can and we have to. We have to learn not to be slaves to uh, uh, these, these passions and these desires that are driving us in a direction that we don't want. That's the whole point. They very often say anger. We lose our temper. We say, oh, why did I do that? 
I know that I get angry at myself. I know it's not good for me. But still, somebody said something, I lose my temper. So we go to anger management school. And we try to find some way to, uh, to learn how to deal with these things. So this is part of, of course, part of spiritual life. Now, one of the great teachings of Sri Ramakrishna is that when we confront these very strong tendencies, this is karma, krodha, loba, all of these, these different passions that we have, lust, anger, greed, envy, jealousy, all of these things, that sometimes we don't uh, go face to face with them. Sometimes we, we attack from the side. And uh, one of his great teachings, which we also find in the Narada Bhakti Sutra, is that we give a twist. We turn them in a different direction. So we utilize them. We recognize the fact that we have certain desires, we have certain passions. So he says that uh, rather than try to just restrain, restraining, it's, it's like there's a huge tsunami that's coming, we have a few sandbags. It's very difficult sometimes when these, these uh, uh, passions come and, and attack us. So he says give them a twist, spiritualize them. So uh, if we have some strong desire for worldly enjoyment, understand real desire is for enjoyment of God. So turn it in that direction. If we suffer from anger, be angry that uh, Mother is not revealing herself to us. So it's a very beautiful uh, type of teaching. And uh, so there's more firya dao. This is the, the language he uses. Twist it and give it a new direction. Turn, turn it so it's facing in a different direction. There was a conversation that Sri Ramakrishna had with some Marwari devotees. He said, anger and lust cannot be destroyed. Turn them toward God. If you must feel desire and temptation, then desire to realize God. Feel tempted by Him. Discriminate and turn the passions away from worldly objects. The ones, uh, Hari, Hari later became Swami Turiyananda, one of the, the stalwarts, one of the direct disciples who we look upon as, as a real yogi, full self control. He once asked Ramakrishna, to remove all trace of lust from him. He was just a teenage boy when he first came. And Sri Ramakrishna surprised him with his answer. He said, why remove lust? Rather increase it, but turn it towards God. Have a burning desire to realize him. So this is one, one technique to utilize these different passions and, and uh, desires and things, give them a twist Godward. The other, uh, Technique, we can say, is replacement. If we have a desire for something, replace it with a desire for something more valuable. And this is why uh, Sri Ramakrishna never emphasized this vairagya so much. Vairagya means dispassion. Whenever he talked about vairagya, he would talk about anuraga. Don't worry too much. You have some trying to get dispassion for the things of the world. Create tremendous passion for God then automatically that will fall off. So it's kind of replacement theory, we can say. There was a very nice conversation that took place. I think it was Swami Virajanandaji, one of the early presidents of our order, that somebody was praising him and said, Oh, Maharaj, what tremendous uh, renunciation you have. And he said, Why? What, would you have greater renunciation? The devotee was very much surprised. Why do I have greater renunciation? He said, look what you've given up. You've given up God for a few enjoyments of the world. And what have I given up? The little mud puddle of the world for God. What I've given up is nothing. Your renunciation is far greater. <laughs> yeah. so of course, being humorous, but we understand that those who recognize uh, what can be gained in this lifetime and how much joy can come from God realization and how much freedom comes from self-realization, then everything else will, will pale in comparison. So this is that idea of kind of, we can say, replacement theory. Then also, if we analyze the desires, desire for enjoyment, one of the desires is the desire for freedom. Nobody likes to be bossed around. If we can recognize that desire for freedom, really that freedom comes from knowing that we're not limited by anything. 
lowering our real nature. And uh, so that'll, again, give us this uh, enthusiasm to realize our true nature, to be free from this type of psychological bondage, this type of bondage where we feel we're not in control. That, uh, uh, and, it, and we all feel it to a certain extent. Some people are very strong and they have a very poor self-image. Uh, this is not a good thing also, but still, to recognize that uh, we have the ability to transcend our lower nature. Now, the point I'm making with this verse, it's really talking about our lower nature. We're not now in a very high Vedantic philosophy, I am the self, forget about everything else. Now we're being realistic people when we talk about it this way. So, once, once we've made this, flip the switch, flip the switch, and now everything is turned Godward, and we feel that pull, then we can say that grace is working. Now uh, we've reached the point where we're not safe exactly, but uh, we feel confident that we have some conviction in our spiritual life, and that we'll continue to be, uh, to continue this this process of transformation. Because spiritual life, there's no realization of anything higher without transformation of the lower self. We can't simply think that uh, uh, it doesn't matter how many problems, this and that, anything. I realize God, I realize God. No, we won't do it unless the mind and heart become pure and transformed. Yes? So desire for freedom, Swamiji. Mm. In a human life, we desire for a lot of you know, things and events mm. and happiness and pleasure through all the worldly pursuits. Mm. When does, freedom from what and when do we develop that desire for freedom? When we recognize that this ultimate slavery is to our lower nature. That we, something within, uh, it'll chafe, that we'll feel that there's something inside of me that is, is pure and perfect and divine. We will get some sense of that, but that there's a mind is pulling it down, and we have some desire to, to go beyond that. It'll happen, we don't know why or how or when. When it happens, we call it grace. And grace means that we don't know exactly the cause and effect. For some people, there'll be a tragedy in life that'll do it. For some people, they'll meet a holy person, and that'll do it. For some, they'll see the example of somebody. They'll see this person constantly suffering. Why? Because he always wants more and more and more. He wants to be wealthier than everybody else, have more power, and, every, and never happy. And then we see somebody else perfectly unselfish and perfectly happy. So we look at the life of Buddha, and he had those four visions. And one, he's seeing all these people, what kind of the joy is that? They're drinking and, and uh, sleeping and overeating, and, and uh, it's like demons, he said. And then he sees a holy man and says, how? Oh, no possessions, nothing, no bondage, full of joy. So uh, these are all instances of grace, because we don't know why and how they come to us, but uh, we feel that uh, some special touch of the divine has turned us in a new direction, something like that. So, so far I've been talking about uh, universal samskaras, these Darwinian samskaras that we all suffer from. Now, when we talk about prakriti or nature, we're also talking about each and every one of us has a different type of nature. So this will be this combination of some scottas and vasanas. Vasanas and some scottas are not two different things. Vasana, we use that term to mean desires. But some scottas, any type of tendency uh, that we have. So uh, we ha have to, on some level, practice surrender and acceptance. At some point, we have to accept ourselves and feel good about ourselves. That at some point, we'll simply say, ah, this is the way that I am. Huh? That uh, uh, you want me to be somebody else, I can't be somebody else. That uh, you have to accept me the way I am, and, and I accept myself the way that I am, and I go along on my spiritual journey and try to realize God and everything, accepting the particular uh, aspects of my being and, and my personality. Now these are the things that perhaps we can't change, and perhaps we shouldn't try to change. So I'll give two examples. But three. Uh, one is kind of a general thing that Sri Ramakrishna says that each and every person is born with an element of either Shiva or Vishnu. Now this is his way of saying that our nature, Prakriti, will be more inclined toward devotion 
Vishnu were more inclined towards knowledge, Shiva. And uh, he gives the illustration of Vijay Krishna Goswami. Vijay Krishna was uh, one of the teachers, one of the acharyas in the Brahma Samaj. The Brahma Samaj people, they had to take a vow not to bow down before any image, that they didn't believe in the avatar, lots of things. Gurus, they didn't believe in a lot of things. And Sri Ramakrishna knew that this was contrary to his prakriti, to his real nature. That he was a Goswami, that means he was born in the line of, of these Vaishnava uh, devotees. And aside from that, Thakur could look inside a person's heart. So he knew that as we died, that uh, he was going against uh, the, the flow of his, of his real nature. And as soon as Vijay realized that, and he left the Brahma Samaj, and he became a great saint. The Vaishnava saint, many people came to him, singing and dancing with joy, with kirtan and everything, all the things that he couldn't do as a Brahma. So sometimes we, we recognize what our real nature is, and we follow it, we use it, and it becomes helpful for us. Now, the other example, and... I have to admit that this may be the real secret behind this verse. That uh, within the context of the Gita, that uh, part of what Sri Krishna is trying to do is to convince Arjuna to fight in the battle. Hmm. So uh, what he's telling him is, you want to go out and beg your food and, and live, live like a sannyasi? He, that uh, Arjuna, uh, in the beginning, that he said, yeah, it'll be better than to fight my own relatives. I'd rather just, but he says, it's not your nature. You're a kshatriya, you're a warrior. And then he says, Paralis tom niyojit, your own nature will force you to fight in this battle. So there's that sense also that uh, there are certain tendencies that we have that are so ingrained in us that better to follow them and utilize them not try to fit ourselves into something that doesn't work for us. So this is what Swamiji calls the path of least resistance. So this, this becomes a positive aspect of this, this particular verse, that uh, we'll all have a certain nature, and if we can gear our spiritual life to that nature, rather than try to suppress it, rather than try, see, I'm really devotional in nature, but everyone likes this, uh, uh, so hum, so hum, let me try that. It won't work. Or vice versa, that somebody says, I try to sing kirtan and all of this, but it doesn't work for me. So then, then we understand that uh, there's a certain level and a certain sense in which it's too hard and it, and it won't work. This is swabhava, it's natural, inherent in us, and we try to follow that. And that becomes very helpful to us. So part of the reason for this verse is that uh, Sri Krishna is trying to tell Arjuna, don't argue with me so much about I won't fight in the war, I won't fight in the war, your very nature is going to make you do it. That don't, don't think that uh, a little cowardice or anything is going to change anything, that that's going to come to the surface, that you're a kshatriya, that you're a warrior. So uh, there we can say that nigraha uh, kamparisati, what will it do to try to pretend that that's not your real nature, that this is uh, something that's going to come out in the very end. Okay, now, I want to finally get to our parable, the this, this scorpion and the this, and this saint. This was a story that Swami Brahmananda, he used to tell, and he, uh, he heard it himself, he said, when he was uh, wandering through Gujarat, during the wandering period, after Thakur passed away, all of the direct disciples, uh, they went out and visited holy places and everything, and he heard this from a monk, and uh, the story of the saint and the scorpion. I think that there's also an Aesop's fable uh, like this. We, somebody can check it. I checked it once. I don't remember. Anyhow, I'm going to read this. Uh, there was a holy man who used to meditate on the bank of a river. One day, he saw a scorpion floating in the water. Afraid it was, he was afraid it would drown, so he scooped it out of the water. As soon as the holy man touched the scorpion, it stung him, and the holy man felt a stab of pain and put it down. Then the scorpion went back in the water, some, somehow. It, he, it hit his hand, and he went like that, and it went back in the water. So then the, the holy man sees that the scorpion is drowning, so he reaches in, he scoops it out, 
He puts it on the ground. Scorpion stings him again on his hand. Same thing. Then he goes like that, and he goes in the water. Third time he pulls it out. This time he goes to a distance and puts it on the ground uh, so that it won't fall back in the water. But each time he got stung. So there was uh, somebody who was watching all of this. And uh, is that I don't understand. Why do you keep saving this, this scorpion when each time it stings you? And he says, look, it's the nature of the scorpion to sting. It's the nature of a holy person to save someone, to help. Why should I change my nature because of the nature of the scorpion? Uh, so this is that story. And uh, it raises again uh, many of these same questions that uh, do we want to look upon people as incapable of changing? Say the scorpion, we say scorpion will, it will always be a scorpion. So this, uh, we have two sides to this. One is that we want to be a little uh, charitable with regard to other people. There are times when someone will be very angry and yell at us when we'll simply say, that's their nature. I won't take it too personally. I know they get upset. They say things they don't mean. They're their nature. I won't bother too much about that. But on the other hand, we don't want to end up saying that uh, this is the nature of them. They'll never change. They'll never get any better. No point in even trying to help them. And we don't want to be patronizing and, sit and think of it as we're the holy people and everyone else is, is like a scorpion. And I'll simply rise above that. That also we don't want to do. So, and we have to realize there are times when we're the scorpion and the other person has to be the same and put up with us. So this can also give us a little sense of, uh, of humility, we can say. But uh, with regard to ourselves, we also get a lot of good lessons here. One is that uh, we should have standards. We should have a way of living in this world uh, of doing good to other people that's not dependent upon the other person, whether they're good to us or whether they appreciate it or anything. It doesn't make any difference at all. That we follow our own standard with regard to things, and that becomes so natural to us that we can't act in any other way. So this is why this Gyanavanapi, even the wise person, we can say, uh, is constrained to act in accordance with his tendencies, because this tendency will now be pure sattva. So we can say on this level uh, that we get to say Holy Mother. Huh? Now, will we say that Holy Mother was bound by her nature because she loved everyone? In a sense, if we want to, in a sense, we can say she's incapable of, of looking upon anybody as a stranger. Now, does that mean that she's under some type of bondage? The, the fact that the holy person acts in accordance with his nature, which is pure goodness, and which comes out of realization, is not the same type of bondage as that which causes the scorpion to sting. It's a completely different type of thing. So that's a sign of freedom uh, when our natural tendency to do something is also what our, our inclination is and, and what we know is the best thing to do. Everything else, there's a conflict. That uh, uh, why do we do things we don't want to do? Uh, that type of thing. So uh, this is a whole different type of thing uh, for Sri Ramakrishna. Now, do we say that it's a type of bondage? He was incapable of telling a lie. Incapable of doing it. So he was forced by his own nature to tell the truth. Now, this is a very negative way of looking at it. It was just natural and spontaneous. And uh, there was no coercion about it that this was a, a principle with him. And uh, so the, the sense in which the, the wise person follows his nature and the sense in which uh, an ordinary person is constrained to follow nature are two completely different things. One is really a type of freedom that one has. So uh, we, we learn these different lessons from this that uh, even the wise person will act according to a very pure nature, sattvic type of nature, whereas everybody else may be constrained by uh, the sense of ego and pride and, and uh, uh, jealousy and envy, all of these other types of things, where the, the holy person, it will just be out of goodness and the desire to help others without caring uh, about getting any thanks in return, even, even getting stung. There was an uh, incident in the life of Vidyasagar, 
You've all heard of Vidyasagar, that he was considered during his day as the most philanthropical person, at least, at least in, the, in Bengal, that he did so much to help other people. He was always helping these poor students, uh, helping giving them money. He was uh, uh, helping these poor widows. He did so many things to help people. So one day somebody said to him that so-and-so was criticizing him, was talking about, about it behind his back. And he said, well, that's funny. I don't remember ever helping that person. Now, this is very interesting because it means that it was his experience that he would help people and then they would criticize him. And he didn't stop him because that was his nature now to do good to people, knowing the nature of some people is that, uh, that they've, they'll just criticize. That's why they say if you want to make an enemy, then loan him money. <laughs> uh, yeah. So there are some people who resent even when we do good things to them. But the, the saint, he didn't care that uh, the scorpion will, uh, whether it's out of resentment or out of his nature, will sting him. He had his own way of, of understanding things. So this is uh, one of the important lessons uh, that we get, that uh, we shouldn't base uh, our standards on what anybody else does or thinks. We can adjust our behavior, of course, but we shouldn't say that I'll be loving and kind to everybody who's nice to me. We should be to everybody, whether they uh, appreciate it or not, then that's a different story. <clears throat> but we have the example of the saint, that he recognized that uh, this is the nature of the scorpion. The nature of the scorpion, I don't, won't take it personally. The scorpion would have done it to anybody else, nothing personal against me. See, we take things so personally. Did you ever notice driving in a car and somebody hunks the horn and you get angry? How? Well, why are they hunking the horn at me? They don't know me. But, I, but I take it so personally. Yeah. So just this is a human nature uh, to think like that. But we have to uh, depersonalize things a little bit and just understand oh, the other person has some place to go. The other person is impatient. That's their problem. It's not my problem. They're impatient. To, so to take this type of, of, of attitude. So I would say that there's a sense in which we develop uh, a double standard. Now normally we think a double standard is something bad. Yeah? We thought oh, you have a double standard. But there's something called a spiritual double standard. I'll give one example. This uh, theory of karma. Now, anything happens to me, I can say, I can't blame anybody else. This is my own karma. This, uh, this, well, I must have deserved this. Now, if we say this to somebody else, it can be very cruel. Some, if somebody has some terrible tragedy, we say, eh, it's your karma. <laughs> so we, we can take a double standard with the other person. We'll say, ah, it was really unfair. We we're so sorry this happened and everything. But with ourselves, we can be a little strict. So this is another type of double standard. And who taught this double standard? Holy Mother. Holy Mother. She said, what did she say? Don't see the faults of others, but see your own faults. It's a double standard. She doesn't say, don't see anybody's faults. She says the faults of others. With our own selves, we can be a little bit hard, a little harsh. So... Uh, what the saint has done is that he's taken something which we would call a fault, dosha, and he's turned it into an attribute or a quality, guna. So this is, this is a formula. This is a formula that for me works very well, that uh, it's not that we're complete fools and we don't recognize this person has a tendency to lie, this person has a tendency to steal, this and that. We recognize that, but we'll say this is a quality or a characteristic of their mind. The guna. We won't say it's a dosha, it's a fault. So, and we won't emphasize it or look for it. Yes? I'm yeah? Listening very carefully, and I think about the sutras when they tell you, you know, don't eat too much or too little, make sure you sleep moderation, which sounds fabulous. Hmm. But I think that it's everyone's nature to eat compulsively. And that was one of the things you listed as, you know, our basic necessities. <coughs> and we cross over and we eat compulsively. And I'm trying to relate this all to that. And yeah, we all have our, you know, we can do pranayama to strengthen and everything else. 
but can you talk a little bit about one of those basic necessities that, where that line kind of crosses and how to flip that compulsive behavior, which is, I believe, most people's nature to at some point, maybe not daily, but at some moment in your life to eat compulsively. At some point. Yeah. Uh, even if it's not compulsively, we have something called hunger, mm -hmm. hunger and thirst, that if we didn't have it, we wouldn't eat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, so yeah, natural. We have to have. For some people, it's a little bit strong. The uh, okay. There's something that I heard once that was uh, I thought a very brilliant statement, and it had to do with again this idea of self-control. Now, as much as we're talking about negra kim karisiti, what can do? We have to have uh, understand that self-control is something that's possible. It's possible to a certain extent, and we have to recognize that. This feeling of self-control gives us greater comfort and a greater feeling of self-image than fulfilling this compulsive desire for other things. So the statement that I heard was that uh, there's no self-respect without self-control. A very interesting statement. No self-respect without self-control. When we feel that uh, we, we're out of control, that means compulsive eating. It means that uh, uh, we're not capable of, of, uh, of saying no. Now, uh, what we're admitting here, we're admitting here that this lower mind is going to present us with uh, these different desires and needs, and the higher mind at some point has to develop the ability to say no. And when we develop that, then we feel better about ourselves. And we recognize that there's greater joy in withstanding pleasure than in, in, than in indulging or overindulging. There's greater joy. This is why uh, this whole idea of renunciation, if renunciation doesn't give us a sense of joy, then it's not renunciation. It, it, it's simply rejecting things. It's, it's, Gita has another nice verse. You fast, that doesn't mean you've lost your desire for eating. You're just postponing it, and then you'll stuff yourself afterwards. So this is understanding that uh, when we develop this power uh, to say no to the mind, to the lower desire of the mind, we feel good about ourselves. We feel in control. We feel closer to the divine. We feel closer to that antaryamin, that divine controller within. And uh, this means the higher mind is, is taking control. This is the fight that goes on between the lower mind and the higher mind. And for most of us, uh, we don't even indulge, to, uh, use this higher mind. We simply indulge the desires of the lower mind. But we, we recognize it, we try to practice it, and we realize that, uh, yes, there's joy in self-control. There's, there's joy in not being a slave to the senses and other things. Anyhow, this is, this is the one thing. Otherwise, there are all different methods for this type of compulsive behavior that uh, some, some people uh, in all aspects of life that uh, they're subject to this, some type of compulsive behavior. Yeah, you're right, that we all have different areas where we have this type of uh, compulsive behavior to a certain degree. And this is what this verse is saying, that, that there is some compulsion. There's some, uh, something that this our lower nature, Prakriti means lower nature, that our lower nature, we want to develop that higher nature, the real swabhava, and, and recognize that, uh, first of all, disidentify with this lower mind. There's another way we can look at it. Recognize that I'm the self, that I'm the witness of, of all these desires. I am not these desires. This one good trick is to utilize this idea of vrittis, that uh, say I have a problem with anger. First thing I say is that I'm not anger. I'm not angry. There's a vritti of anger that is this, 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 uh, within the mind. This vritti has arisen. This anger vritti, the anger modification of the mind. I'm not angry. I'm observing the mind that's, that's broken out in this little ripple of anger. But I'm not that. And if we can do that, then it'll dissipate. It'll slowly disappear. It won't be such a problem for us. So this is a, a, another way of looking at it. Rather than saying, yes, I have these desires, I have these compulsions, say these are qu aspects, qualities of this lower mind that I don't even like anymore. The problem in spiritual life is that there's a big gap 
between uh, the, the way our mind functions, lower mind, and what we see as the ideal, what we want out of life. I, I say that I want God alone, the lower mind says, no, no, you still want some enjoyment. Huh? So the battle takes place, the lower mind and the higher mind. So we simply have to recognize, I am that higher mind, I am that, that higher self. Huh? Not simply, but anyhow, this is one way that we can, that we can try. Yeah. Uh, so is this what is called sublimation? Yeah, we have this idea of sublimation, that sublimation in, in, in a positive sense is really supposed to make something uh, dissipate and disappear a little bit. So wh one of the ways that we do this, and we've talked about it, one is replacement. Huh? One is we give a different twist to it. And the other is if we have these, these desires and everything and we don't feed them, we don't feed them. It's not that we have to push them under the surface because that doesn't work. Then they'll just come back stronger. But to sublimate them, to really make them kind of lose their power and force. So this is that, that uh, technique, we can say, of simply not pouring water on the weeds. Let them die out on their own. Yeah. So, yeah, sublimation uh, is different from suppression. And also convert it to something. Convert it or utilize it. This is Takwar's way of doing it. He said you keep fighting and fighting against something. No, just go in the other direction. Yeah. You, you want to leave the east, walk towards the west. Yeah. That's why, as I say, he, he emphasizes anuraga more than vairagya. Uh, that field is pull for God rather than keep pushing the world around, uh, away. Look upon this world as something of lesser value. God has something more value. And uh, that'll, that'll pull you in that direction. So we don't have to fight, we don't have to try to sublimate so much. There's more kind of replacement type of thing. But yeah, suppression simply means that we're pushing it down and it'll gain in force and it'll come back even stronger. So uh, they use these terms suppression, sublimation is a way of, of uh, really dissipating the force uh, of these desires and tendencies and everything. Uh, but really, uh, the more we do spiritual practice, we do our spiritual practice with, with great uh, faith and, and uh, regularity and everything, this, this transformation will take place. It will take place. And through uh, real sincere prayer that uh, we can change and everything, it will happen. It will happen. But we need sincerity. And we have to have a real desire, real desire to, to change. I think I've gone through everything. So, anyhow, this, if we can take the attitude of the saint, we'll find that uh, we're not affected by uh, the behavior of other people, what other people say to us, and we, we feel that we're living according to a very higher type of standard. We'll learn not to judge other people. This is what Holy Mother meant. She didn't mean that we, wanted, we have to be fools. We don't see that somebody has some negative tendencies. We won't judge them. And we'll accept people for what they are. We'll accept them with great kindness and so to be charitable towards other people. If they're not nice to us, we say, uh, they have some reason. They may also not be happy with the way their mind works. They may be suffering more than I am. Take a charitable point of view. And to not take things so personally. And to recognize that we won't abandon uh, our feeling of, of love and kindness and compassion for others because of what they may do in return to us. So these are all very beautiful teachings that we get from this one parable, and I think also from this verse of Bhagavad Gita, that certain elements of our personality, uh, we accept and we utilize and we give them a twist and make them helpful for us. Other aspects of our personality that uh, we try to transcend, and do we do it through our spiritual practice, uh, we do it through some type of self-effort, and uh, a really most important thing is that we're sincere in our spiritual life. And then this change will come. So, yeah, now we can formally have questions. We had the, yeah, okay, just 12 o'clock. <laughs> I gave this talk a couple of other times, and, and there were people who really disagreed with it. Uh, they, yeah. Could you tell us how, in what way? 
Uh, first of all, this idea of swabhava. Somebody said, no, swabhava means I am Brahman, the real nature. And, uh, but actually in Gita, we look all the times it's used. Swabhava is, has to do with the lower nature that way. And then uh, others that, uh, no, it's not trying to say that we're slaves to our personality. Or, and yeah, different types of things. Mm. But, yeah. Okay, question. Swamiji, um, so as human beings, we have some skaras, mm. which we don't know that we have mm. when we are born. And we also are, uh, we, we, our function is based on our personality and our mind. Mm. So we are uh, wired mm -hmm. to kind of be slaves of our mind and personality mm -hmm. in our daily function. So is it just spiritual practice that helps us recognize or go beyond our personality and our mind? Or, or do you have some other ways and means that we can do on a daily basis? Yeah, some of it is just maturity. That when we're young, we don't recognize any of these things. We act out of anger, out of jealousy, all sorts of things. We reach a certain age when we recognize that we have these tendencies, and then we recognize we don't like them somehow. And then we recognize that uh, there's nobody forcing us to act in accordance with these tendencies. Uh, that there's some that we can actually uh, learn to, to uh, get rid of. To, uh, we have some tendency uh, to, to be very jealous of other people. Uh, and then at some point we reach, the, we reach an age or something happens to us and we say, good, let them enjoy it. This person is smarter than I am, so what? Well, how does that affect me? Something happens. It's a type of maturity or spiritual maturity. Uh, but we have to be introspective people. This is the main thing. Examine our own minds. Try to find out uh, why we react the way that we do. Uh, is it beneficial? Is it helpful? Do we like that aspect of ourselves? And then make some attempt to try and learn the distinction between what we can change and what we can't change. This is what that verse is telling us, that there'll be some element of our personality that would say, yeah, basically, uh, uh, I'm a, a soft-natured devotional person. I'm not going to try to change that. I'll gear my spiritual life to that. But I also have some tendency to get angry. I want to change that. It's not beneficial. It's not helpful. So we learn the difference between the two. And uh, so we have to be, as I say, introspective, examine the mind, and... Uh, uh, then be hard on ourselves. And also uh, recognize that there are certain environments, there are certain the type of company that we keep that brings out the worst in us, and we say no more. There's certain types of enjoyments, certain types of indulgences that we do that we know are not beneficial. And then we have to be harsh and say no. That I know that this isn't good for me, I'm not gonna do it. Like uh, someone has, uh, suffers from alcoholism, and then I, no, I simply can't go, I go to the bar with my friends, I'll start drinking, I know that, I recognize that. So I simply can't do it. And I, if, they can, if they can manage, then tremendous self-respect will come. They'll, still, I know that that tendency is there, it's not gonna die. I know it's there, but I know that I have the power to control, control it, yeah. So. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, there's a question up here also. Yeah. Pranam Swamiji. Uh, you talked about anuraga. Mm. Uh, my question is, uh, it's, it's easier to eat food when you are hungry, but it's difficult to deliberately make an attempt to feel hungry. So how, how do you inculcate <laughs> that anuraga? How do you Very good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. How do you increase love for God, is yeah. my question. Yeah. Sri Ramakrishna's uh, answer for almost everything, if we, if we look very carefully, all of the questions that, uh, uh, how do we realize, how do we, almost, uh, I would say, almost all of the time, his first answer is holy company. That if we, if we see that there's somebody who has devoted a lifetime to this, that has that love of God, that is filled with joy, that is free from all types of attachments, then we feel that pull. We may not feel the pull for God that, that they, 
Uh, they have that realization. We don't have that realization, but we see that uh, whatever they have, I want. And uh, so this, this longing for something that we don't know. Everybody is striving for something that we don't know. We have no idea what this ultimate experience of God realization will be like. We have some idea by reading what Thakur tells us, or the other well, holy people. We have some idea that way, but personally, we don't know. So many people say that. How can I love God when I don't know what God is like or anything? Uh, sometimes they say, you know, the name of God. Some people can develop a love for the name of God. Uh, the advantage that devotees of uh, Sri Ramakrishna and Holy Mother have is that they're so real to us because they're so recent and we have their pictures and their words. And we have a direct connection through their disciples. Yeah. And Sri, Sri Ramakrishna says, loving the avatar and loving God are one and the same thing. So if we can feel Love for Sri Ramakrishna, Holy Mother. Now, I don't want to limit to that. We have so many others, the Vaishnava traditions and everything, they feel that same love for maybe Krishna or whatever. But in our case, uh, we don't have to try to imagine anything. That we, they're real to us. And uh, we can feel that this, this Leela is going on, even now. Very present, and, and uh, we want to experience that and have that joy. So I would say Holy Company, number one. Number two, immerse, we should immerse ourselves in reading the Gospel of Sri Krishna. To me, this is the one thing that will bring, uh, awaken this anuraga, this love for God. The more we read and the more we feel ourselves to be one with it and to feel ourselves sitting in the room with Sri Krishna and feeling him to be alive, and even now, feeling that if only we could go, we could sit in the room with him and all the devotees are there. This Nitya Leela idea, that this divine play is going on all of the time. And then I think this is some love of God will come from that way. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Mahakashti Tukabhag Bhavet Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Thank you everyone. Yeah, sure. Whatever you like. Right. Yeah. Um.